All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you again for coming here. Um, so yeah, my name is Jack May. I'm a grad student at Cal State Long Beach. Um, this is my second summer out here. Last summer I was out here mostly like Emerald Bay, um, getting some really good drone video of leopard sharks out there. But um, yeah, so today we'll talk a little bit about my research as well as just a little bit about me. So we'll start off there. So originally from Fredericksburg, Virginia, so East Coast, right? A uh, little historic uh, Civil War battle site, so pretty cool history. Um, if you ever happen to be in town, Carl's Frozen Custard, highly recommend, delicious. <laughs> All, right. All right, so a lot of people ask, like, hey, Jack, like, you know, how'd you get into this line of work? Like, you know, marine biology, sharks specifically, you know, so I'll go a little bit about, like, my inspiration, how that happened. So, uh, growing up in Virginia, basically, uh, I got the eastern shore over there, kind of like on the other side of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so we take family trips out there, go camping, whatever. Um, and yeah, like, it's the first time I kind of, like, got to see the ocean in person, like, saw how vast and like endless it was, and I knew there were some critters in there, I couldn't really see them. Um, that was pretty fascinating to me. So kind of like the mystery and like how big it was, so kind of like hooked at a young age. Um, yeah, grew up fishing, um, you know, so just seeing fish swim around, like mind blown, like wow, they live in there. Um, you know, you go fish, you never really know what you're gonna pull out, so again, kind of just kept me fascinated. Documentary, so, so David Attenborough right there, right? So, uh, yeah, just growing up watching uh, shark documentaries early on, again, just absolutely hooked, fascinated. Um, and then, cannot leave this out, so all the major motion pictures and uh, Probably at far too young of an age, uh, was certainly terrified, probably for life. But more so than terrified, I was fascinated. So, like, elementary school on, like, anytime we went to the library, shark books, you know, whatever I can. So, trying to learn as much as I could. So, uh, as I, you know, got through high school and all that, I um, wanted to go to a good school where, like, they had marine biology as a major. So, I ended up at University of North Carolina, Wilmington majored in marine biology, uh, but when that was going on, I also kind of had another itch I wanted to scratch. Ended up kind of going the military route for a little bit. So during the summers between uh, semesters, I went off to Officer Candidate School, do the whole uh, United States Marine Corps officer business. Um, ended up getting commissioned after I was finished up with school on the USS North Carolina, um, and ended up in the fleet out here in Camp Pendleton, California. So here I am rocking out with my little gas mask and a you know, little chemical suit on in the middle of the day because training is fun, I guess. Um, all right, so I ended up doing two deployments. Uh, so I ended up on uh, U.S. ships, 3rd Battalion, basically ended up like sailing through the Pacific out of San Diego, ended up in like the Middle East, did some circles, came back. So it's really great. I ended up doing that twice, like a year and four months at sea, something like that. Um, yeah, like a lot of great experiences. Went to places I never thought I would see, you know, like Oman, you name it. Really cool. So. Meanwhile, I had a lot of free time, right? So pretty much what wasn't like in the ship's gym, pretty much uh, reading books about sh like sharks, fishes, um, invertebrates. Just kind of like, because I didn't necessarily want to do it for a career, so I kind of wanted to keep up with the whole marine biology thing. So um, as I approached my end of active service, um, I actually had a friend who I went to undergrad with at UNCW who was out in Hawaii, kind of like living my dream, kind of stopped in, saw a shark lab like on the way in and out. Um, and he got me in touch with uh, Dr. Chris Lowe, so I studied for the GRE when I was on ship. Got back, took it, you know, got in touch with Chris, everything worked out, bam, so now I'm in the shark lab, right? <laughs> so, like, loving it, uh, every bit of it. So, working towards a master's degree right now, so I finished up all my classes this last semester, so now it's just me and my project, right? I gotta face my thesis demons. Um, and then, yeah, so not only did I get to work on my project with the leopard sharks, which we'll go about a little bit more detail here in a bit, uh, we also have our juvenile white shark project. Um, they're doing a lot of outreach this summer at beaches, it's really cool. Um, and yeah, I've also worked with um, some giant sea bass, horn sharks, round rays. So getting a lot of experience working with other uh, students in other labs as well. So pretty much like really liking what I'm doing right now. It's pretty awesome. Um, so here we are, this uh, Chris and I doing um, some surveys for juvenile white sharks. Um, so basically turn our little boat here into an aircraft carrier. Um, pretty good time. So without any further ado, so let's talk uh, leopard sharks, specifically more about aggregation. So what is an aggregation, right? So that's basically like just a group of animals coming into like relatively close to the space, right? So the idea is if animals are doing this, there's got to be more benefits for them coming together than like negative costs associated with that, right? So some of the benefits can be for social reasons. Animals like to be with each other. Uh, can be to find a mate or to exploit a resource. So this can be like a patch of like desirable habitat, like there's a particular tree you like to live in, um, or maybe like there's only like a little area where you can find your food, right? So that'll bring animals in to kind of all get a piece of that. Now, there are some negative sides, though. So you're all packed in tight with each other. If one individual has like a disease or a parasite, it can be transmitted to other individuals a lot more quickly, rapidly. Um, so there are some negative sides as well as increased competition, right? So we were talking about those little like small patches of like resource that you might want to take advantage of. If you have a lot of individuals all trying to capitalize on that, 
all of a sudden there might not be enough to go around, individuals have to start competing, things like that. So another negative side, uh, although there can be safety in numbers from time to time, like confused predators, things like that, um, it can, like for things like whales, humans, we're really good at keying in on like big groups of things and you can like wipe out a whole bunch really fast. So just something else to think about as we move along here. All right, so but for my project though, we're looking at leopard sharks, right? Turns out leopard sharks, uh, especially in the summertime, like to come in these like really big groups um, and especially in shallow water, typically happens like hot summer months, right? Shallow water, especially around these parts. Um, so the uh, leopard shark, slowly mature. So from birth, takes them about 10 to 12 years to become like reproductively mature. Uh, they have a long gestation period of up to a year. So what that means is basically like when they become pregnant, it takes them about a, the mama shark about a year um, to brood her little shark pups. Um, they range from Mexico all the way to Oregon, USA. So pretty widespread uh, West Coast distribution. All right, but so back to that vulnerability point. So up until 1994, there was a near shore gillnet fishery. Um, it was pretty much uh, not the cleanest one, so it caught up a lot of bycatch, things like that. Um, and as you can see here on the y-axis, catch amount. So basically from like late 1970s to about here, you can see like those catch rates or catch numbers ended up starting to drop off over time. And so this isn't necessarily because they started fishing less, there were just less sharks to go around, right? So there, it would basically came to the conclusion that their populations were taking a pretty big hit. Remember, it takes a long time to mature, and like it takes them a long time to brood more pups. What's so, that vertical axis? Is that thousand tons? Metric tons, yeah. Metric, metric tons. So yeah, a lot of sharks. Um, so yeah, there you can see here in uh, 1994 is where that fan goes into place. Um, catch rates kind of stay the same over here, but this is the cool one here. So this is CPU year, catch per unit effort here on the y-axis, right? So basically the same amount of fishing effort from 1995 on after that gillnet fan, um, their numbers started to come back. So it's actually a really good kind of like success story for like policy, management, especially here in Southern California where uh, they decided to ban that um, gillnet fishery. So really cool. All right, so next thing I wanna talk about is behavioral thermal regulation. So basically all that means is like if you're hot, you move somewhere to cool off, you know, cool to cool off and vice versa, right? Um, so for leopard sharks, they're ectotherms, which basically means cold-blooded, right? So whatever their body, their body temperature will match whatever the surrounding seawater is. So if the water's warm, they'll be warm. If the water's cold, they'll be cold. Um, so what uh, some previous work has shown is these light columns here. This is um, basically during daylight hours. You can see temperature increases. And then at night, you can see it decreases. Not mind-blowing, right? Especially in shallow water where like the sun can really like have an impact. Um, so what they found though is these little black diamonds, these are average numbers of sharks, and then the little circles, that's average temperature. So as average temperature increased, so too did the average number of sharks, vice versa, right? So the idea is like, okay, so we're getting a lot of sharks during the day when it's warm, then they're taken off at night. At night, they're thought to be moving just into deeper, cooler waters, uh, look for food, and then back in the daytime when that water heats up again, they tend to return. So why are these sharks looking for this warm water? So what we think is going on is that uh, typically what we mostly see are mature females, and we expect those to be uh, pregnant. And so what we think is going on is these mature females are looking for this warm water that they can only find like in the shallows, like during these hot months, increase their body temperatures, therefore increase their metabolism, and brood these pups a little bit faster. So kind of shorten that one year time span, right? Okay, so for my experimental design to kind of like get a closer look at these sharks and what's going on, uh, so again, I was out here last summer. So Emerald Bay right here, um, let's see, Big Fisherman's Cove, that's us right here. So yeah, so Emerald Bay, that's where I ended up spending most of my days flying surveys, lots and lots of sharks out there, great visibility, good time. I also saw some last summer here at Catalina Harbor, but visibility there is like not the best. So especially when you're talking drones, trying to see them from the air, not necessarily the best case scenario. Heard about some in White's Landing, but a little bit more wave action there, which I'll kind of get into why that's a problem. But so this summer, it turns out they, I've only been finding them here. So visibility or no, that's probably where I'm going to get started. So pretty cool. But um, what I do is I fly um, little <coughs> surveys using a Phantom 4 um, Pro version 2. Um, and I do that at all the confirmed aggregation sites that I can get my hands on, basically. Um, and then I'm also collecting seafloor temperature at those aggregation sites to get an idea of what temperatures these sharks are swimming through. And I do that using these little temperature sensors. I basically lay out like a bunch of those along the seafloor to get an idea of like kind of the distribution of temperature. All right, so here's Big Fisherman's Cove, which should look kind of familiar. Um, all right, so this would kind of be an example of the first of three segments that I would do for a flight. So fun little animation, but yeah, basically like overlapping transects, trying to get an idea of where the sharks are um, and how many like little pockets of them there might be. All right, so that's the first of the three segments. Here's just kind of a picture on the map, kind of how that looks again. 
So you got your left shark swimming around. That's my highest altitude where I'm just, again, trying to get an idea of the lay of the land, where the sharks are. Once I've identified a discrete aggregation, so a discrete being just like singular, so like you got a pocket over here, a pocket over here. Um, I'll then hover over the sharks about five to 10 minutes, battery dependent, um, and then move down to a lower altitude of about 10 meters. And from there, from that like relatively low altitude, I can get really good high resolution images. And with those, I can kind of make a crack at getting um, really good size estimates. All right, so out there flying the, you know, the drones, got sharks and drones, pretty cool, having a good time. This is kind of how I feel it looks like, you know, out here living my dream, doing some research. <laughs> Turns out this is more what it looks like, right? So that's me with the sheet over my head so I can actually block out just like all the glare so I can see the live feed from the tablet, see where the sharks are at. Um, then I'll have my visual observer standing right next to me while I'm doing this so they can keep an eye on the drone, make sure everything's safe and all that. All right, so for temperature maps, um, so here's, um, this is Emerald Bay here, and you can see these like little yellow discs around here. So those are basically just concrete little discs I made, made by hand um, that hold on to my temperature sensor. So they serve a couple of cool roles, one of which is being an object of known size, and also lets me kind of like geo-reference images. I'll get into that later though. So for those uh, little temperature loggers that are on these little yellow discs, they can log temperature every 10 minutes, every hour, kind of whatever I tell it. Last summer I did an hour, this year, or yeah, this year I'm gonna go a little bit more uh, fine resolution about every 10 minutes or so. So uh, get a better idea of like how changing over time will look. So use a variety of interpolation techniques. And all that means is basically I know those little sample points and that kind of helps fill in the dots, right? So I can kind of get an idea of what the temperature looks like in the areas they're swimming through. All right, so I'm just gonna orient this north real quick. Okay, so there's like, just so you can, just in case you can see them, that's kind of the distribution of the temperature lockers I had out there. Okay. So this is what it looks like after I've kind of done that analysis, right? So you can see you got some warm water in the shallows and then cold water out deeper. So the idea is they come to this warm water here because they can't get it anywhere else. So like in El Nino here, so we've seen where there's warm water like everywhere, we've seen them actually stop showing up. So it's pretty interesting. So I think it's uh, typically what draws them to aggregate is when you have these isolated pockets. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. Okay. So here we go. So this is a cool animation I can show you. So around like <clears throat> midnight and into the early morning, um, the temperature is like pretty uniform, right? Pretty cool, uniform. During the day, right in here, you can see those red pockets start to form. So where it's really shallow, that's where the sun is heating up that water. So just a neat little animation to kind of show you what you already kind of knew, which is that warm water is going to like get hotter during the middle of the day and kind of cool off, become uniform. All right. So here's just a quick little sample video. So you can see got like one little discrete <coughs> aggregation here. And then we have another one right here. So this is just an example. Okay, I've kind of identified them. Now I'll sit down, hover over this one for a few minutes. And then you can see here, uh, so these are those little yellow discs. Each one of these has a temperature logger on it, um, which I can then pull that data, kind of make that little temperature map. Now they also help with size estimates. So there's one of those right here. Um, so basically what I can do is in software like ImageJ or Photoshop, I can like calibrate the image, image. And all that really means is that I can take like, okay, so I knew this disc was about 25 centimeters long, so I get however many pixels that is, and then basically just use that to convert however many pixels the shark is to centimeters, right? So then I can get a fairly accurate way of getting the sizes of all the different sharks that I have swimming around, and then I can start looking at like our different size sharks swimming in different temperatures, is there like any kind of dominance hierarchy where like the big ones are forcing the little ones out, things like that. Okay, so yeah, concrete, known size. All right, so now what I've done, taking those, uh, those uh, images from the drone, uh, is I then can geo-reference it. And that basically just means like placing it in the world like where it would be on a map, right? So I can do that using those little concrete disks and those known GPS locations that I had for it. Um, then you can see some little sharks swimming around here. So what I do is I plot the location of the sharks, create a layer with that. Uh, I pull that image away, add the temperature. Now you have sharks swimming in the temperature that they were actually swimming through, right? So pretty cool. So the thing is though, right now, this is all very like manual labor intensive, I'm trying to find some ways to do this with some computer software to kind of speed things up. But um, here's a quick cool animation. So I took uh, 25 samples from about five minutes, geo-referenced them all and plotted the sharks. And you can kind of see how they move around during about a five, 10 minute period. So although you're kind of um, seeing uh, like a distribution, like kind of like, you're seeing like a core of like movement around in here, but you do see some individuals kind of like pop off and they'll come back or maybe not. So we would kind of see a core area of usage, which is cool. All right, so back to that computer software. So ideally, we want to create something that can like take those images, you know, so I don't have to do it with my own eyes. And they can like ID each shark, give it a number, and then basically follow it over time. So you can get X, Y location of where it was, its size, speed, distance between other individuals, all that kind of good stuff. 
So here's a cool little video of this happening, right? So this is like best case scenario where we have like a really nice, like uniform background, high contrast with the sharks. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen all the time. So we're still kind of iron out the details to get this to work for some other stuff. But really cool, this will make my life a lot easier and get a lot more useful data out of that video. Okay, so sharks, drones, really cool, right? But like, why does anybody care? So basically we're taking the next step in understanding like their aggregation behavior. Um, you know, like, is it for social reasons? Like, do individuals tend to be closer to each other, like, beyond just what would be by chance? Um, and, yeah, we're using drone technology, kind of pushing the envelope a little bit, uh, combining it with ecology. So if we do kind of iron out some of these kinks, um, we can basically, like, this could be useful methods for other people doing similar research. So, leopard sharks. High trophic level species. What that means is uh, they're not necessarily like apex predators, but still pretty high up there on the food chain. So if you pull those out, kind of like the wolves in Yellowstone, it kind of has like a lot of cascading negative effects potentially. So important species to keep around. And like we talk about, uh, where they come together in shallow water, especially really close to humans, um, and they're all like mature females. If you were to like remove them, like if humans decided to just easily go up and like scoop those out, could have a really detrimental impact on their population. So an important species to kind of continue to manage. And then in the future, if we can kind of get an idea of what temperatures these sharks are occupying and what causes them to aggregate in the future, if we know what temperatures are going to be, we might have a better idea of where they'll go in the future. And just, again, continue to better manage them and form policy and things like that. All right, so just want to thank you again for coming out. Um, all my volunteers were great. And then, yeah, USC, thank you for having me out here for my second summer. I greatly appreciate it. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Awesome. Live here? Oh yeah, we got orange sharks, swell sharks, soup fin sharks. Um, and wait, then, yeah, like we even have like, no, like sharks. Mm -hmm. We got leopard sharks. You know it. Great question. Oh wait. We got a question. What else we got? Have you explored any other reasons besides temperature for them coming to shallow water? So, um, so some of the previous work, they tried to like kind of peel back the onion and see if there was other stuff. And at least for here, like the biggest thing they found was temperature. At least temperature was like the main driver. So of course, there's a lot of other factors probably in play, but I think that's one of the bigger ones. Are you able to detect under the surface? Great question. So it depends on the day, right? So sometimes like zero feet, you know, and then other days when it's like really pristine, nice, calm, um, you know, 20 feet plus probably. And like uh, any little ripple will kind of distort what they look like, but you can still tell like there's a shark. There's a shark. They eat? Oh, great question. So they eat a lot of stuff. So basically uh, kind of like generalists, they'll eat like uh, fish eggs, small fish, lots of invertebrates, crabs, worms, you name it. So pretty much whatever they can kind of grab. Yeah. Uh, I think there's like what, maybe one recorded leopard shark like negative interaction. Uh, yeah, so very, very unlikely. I was swimming with them all last summer and yeah, they're pretty skittish. Um, yeah, we're not worry too much about leopard sharks. You see signs that the sharks hang with mates or buddies or anything. So that's kind of what we want to look at here, right? So like, kind of like ID individuals and see if they kind of keep hanging around. Um, so there's some other work out there, kind of doing like social network analysis. So hopefully we'll see in the future if that's the case or not. But we think there might be a little something going on there for sure. How do they mate? Mates. Um, so the males have uh, these two little things called claspers, and it's actually kind of aggressive, but they'll grab onto the females and. Yeah, about once a year, so. Are you doing all that drone work by hand? Fairly symmetrical paths laid out. Do you program the first path right. and then manually do the. Good question. So, depending on the location, so like here, Big Fisherman's Cove, it's a little bit larger. Um, I try and use this app called Litchi. And with that, basically, I can't do like the pre programmed flight, so I make sure I have like my, you know, like intersecting set, like segments and everything. Uh, but for some spots that are a little bit smaller, it's like easier and faster just to do it manually, you know, and then I can kind of change, you know, if there's glare or something, I can kind of enable it however I want. So it um, kind of depends on the situation, but yeah. Yes? Oh, sorry. So it sounds like you're doing marine biology, but you still do a lot of programming. <laughs> well, yeah, so we've collaborated with a lot of different people to like work with the computer software stuff. So like, I code like a little bit, but that's like kind of still above me a little bit. But yeah, like trying to merge as much technology as we can to kind of answer questions that without that technology is really hard to answer. Yes? Is this where they give birth as well? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Um, So, I mean, because they have such like a wide distribution, I mean, it's like fairly safe to assume that they're giving birth around here, but I don't think I could say that for sure, though. But yeah, I, like I see lots of small sharks around here, so I, yeah, I'd say it probably didn't happen too far away for sure.
You, you talk about the tracking juvenile whites. I assume those are maybe great whites? Yes, yeah, juvenile white sharks, yep. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of great whites around here? Uh, yeah, so especially like closer to like um, like the mainland, lots of juveniles. Like the little nursery hot spots, I think they like um, going after like all the rays, all the little round rays that are around there, and kind of like the warmer temperatures. Um, and yeah, usually it's like winter comes around, it usually gets a little bit too cold for them, and they'll head south to Mexico. Um, and it's not until they get bigger that they start making like those trips out to like the islands with all like your big seals. So I'm curious, so do we not know where they give birth? Like it seems like they don't know about great whites. Right, yes, exactly. So I mean, that's the thing, like you can't watch them all the time, you know, like you'll know, yeah. like, hey, we saw this female last year, appeared to be pregnant, saw it again like a month later yeah. and it wasn't anymore, you know, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint like when that birth happened. Uh, yeah, so some previous work has shown like the ones that do the ag like aggregation, um, they will check them out, they're typically females, and then they have done like some like sonogram kind of stuff and like found out that they were in fact pregnant, so. Yes. So again, so the males have these things called claspers and the females do not. So that's pretty much all it takes. Yeah. Questions? Yes? How many drone flights will you do in a season? In a season? So and then it depends on the aggregations, like if I can find them and if the conditions are good and all that. But ideally, I mean, in a neighborhood of like 200, probably, yeah. So a lot, a lot. Once, once I get it like all set up, get my temperature loggers in the water, get the drone out there, just fly and fly and fly, which isn't the worst field work ever because you pretty much just hang out at the beach all day. And fly <laughs> so. But setting up those temperature loggers, that, that's the trick. That, that, that's a lot of heavy work. I thought I saw some mm -hmm. uh, shark eggs one time. Mm -hmm. They were brown and but like this and points. And yeah. Do, do, does each um, shark, different shark, have a different kind of egg? So they can, and then interestingly enough, some give live birth. So shark, uh, so leopard sharks, white sharks, a lot of species out there will give live birth. Um, but there are ones like horned sharks, which will actually like lay the egg case, whatever. Lots of seeds and stuff, same thing. And they will kind of look different depending on. Species. Is emerald the only place that you do your research? So, yeah, so last summer um, I started here, but they had already taken off. Like, I had just missed them because uh, I got here like July, like early July. So they had already taken off. Um, and then, yeah, White's Landing, we had seen some. Cat Harbor. Cat Harbor has kind of like rough visibility, though. So this year I'm probably going to start there whether I like it or not. But yeah, Emerald just happened to have sharks and was incredibly so pristine. Did they change around the island? They migrate around the island? So, previous work where they actually did like the tagging, because I don't do any tagging, right? So, in previous work though, where they had done the tagging, they actually did end up going to like different aggregation sites. So, they don't necessarily revisit the same one every single day. Um, there were ones that were tagged here that would then end up, you know, uh, like on the mainland. So, they, they move around quite a bit. Do, do other sharks come in and make them leave? Or, I mean, is, is there. Do they intermingle or do they stay separate? So they kind of like, they intermingle. Um, and then I haven't seen another shark species like approach them and like freak them out or anything. Like you'll see a lot of um, Southernose guitar fish, like bat rays, they all kind of share a lot of common ground. Um, but what we have seen though, at least anecdotally, like I haven't personally seen it, is uh, sea lions. Sea lions will come and hunt these. So we have a big male that lives out there and we think that, you know, <laughs> I loosely think that that might be the reason why the sharks aren't coming here right now. We have a lot to back that up, but just kind of. Um, so Sorry, yeah. Did you say the sea lions hunt the sharks? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So they typically like will like basically take the liver, which has a lot of nice fatty energy in it, and then uh, that'll be about it. Though. So like you'll find like the carcasses. Yeah. They came here one year with all these pregnant sharks. Yeah. Savage sea lions. Yes. Do the sharks like tiger sharks live here? We don't typically see tigers around here unless there was like a pretty pretty hot like El Nino event. Like I think that might be possible. Typically pretty unlikely, yeah. So currently you're not seeing any leopard sharks out here in two parts? No, in not here, but like just on the other side in Cat Cat uh, Catalina Harbor or whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, seeing, seeing a decent amount of that, probably like 40 to 50 even. Of what I can see too, right? So it's really yeah. not that great. Uh, years ago I was up at Corpus Christi uh, surfing, mm -hmm. and every once in a while you'd see a big seal float in without a head. Somebody told me sharks were biting their heads off. It's certainly possible, yeah. <laughs> but then you're telling me here that sea lions hunt the sharks. Yeah, so different different species though, right? So like leopard sharks, like they're a little bit more kind of like stick to the bottom, you know, uh, you know, looking for little fish. 
Yeah, sea lion pretty much probably weighs more than most of them can go in there, especially the big males to kind of take advantage. And they're saying like uh, orcas are out there getting white sharks now, you know, same thing, take the liver and kind of just leave the rest. So sharks are not at the tippy top like we always thought they necessarily were. Yeah. Like, like underwater cables something? Potentially, yeah, especially when they go into deeper waters at night, like <laughs> kind of hard to say exactly where they go. So like they could, because they don't, they're not um, what's called obligate ram ventilator. So they don't have to swim at all times um, to breathe like a white shark would have to do. Uh, a leopard shark can just lay on the bottom and kind of like pump water over its gills. So like if they wanted to hang out in the cave and chill, they could. Doing the, the movement patterns, do you have to ID the sharks in the photos yourself, or the videos yourself, or just the computer? Yeah, so right now it's all it's all me. I'm the computer. You know, so like right now, like doing it the slowest way imaginable, but I plan to at least, if we can't get the details ironed out, I'll at least get like an army of volunteers to help me out. But yeah, like I'll watch the video, like from point A to point B, you know, and be like, oh, there it was, there it was, take that frame, mark it on there with like, you know, paint or Photoshop, whatever. And then once that was marked, I can then take those into Arc Map or whatever. So it's a program that is what actually allows me to put that image like on the world, you know, and then like layer that with the temperature map, all that good stuff, and then put it size, and then start asking all kinds of questions. Yeah. So you said in the past that the, the sharks were tagged. Yes. So you could see where they went, but now you don't. You right. So um, the tags have like a shelf life. So like once the battery goes, that's that, right? So they have like a little acoustic ping. And you have to have the receiver set up for that. So the receivers are now, most of those are gone, and the tags have probably all died. So, quite a few years ago, so some of the sharks might. Great questions.